All right, looks like we'll go ahead and get started here. Doesn't look like we see anybody else flowing in at the moment. So uh, this talks about sync thing and your password manager. Uh, if this is not the talk you're expecting in this room, you're in the wrong room. Uh, my name's Marcus, a um, little bit about me. I am an enthusiast of free and open source software, <coughs> Linux, that sort of thing. Um, kind of a sysadmin in training at this point, um, hoping to have a career path that leads me towards that in the next year or two. Um, primarily have worked as a systems analyst and in the data center for City of Seattle, as well as for a network security company in Seattle mm. as well. So passwords suck. We suck at remembering them. It's hard to remember passwords that are complex, that meet complex length and requirements of having, you know, two symbols, three numbers, three capital letters, and an Egyptian hieroglyph. We suck at making them too. If we suck at remembering them, we also suck at making them too, because we want to make something that's easy to remember, because we have so many accounts to keep track of. <coughs> Computers are good at guessing them. That's the other problem. The passwords that we make, easy for a computer to guess. They can brute force them pretty quickly, especially with advancements in GPU technology. <coughs> Biometrics are a supplement, not a replacement. If you've seen the recent thing about the Galaxy with the face unlock deal, um, fingerprints can be cloned as they've proved. So they're a good addition, but they're not a replacement. So not anything really until we can, uh, I don't know, use a sample of DNA or something. Still in 2019, not everything has multi-factor authentication. This is a pain point for me because this is probably one of the best ways to prevent brute forcing for online accounts, but yet there's still a fair amount of services out there that don't support this, which is just crazy to me. And also I've even seen as a sort of stand-in for MFA, not a robot test or CAPTCHAs. Um, honestly, there's open source framework now that can beat these pretty reliably. Um, so unless you come up with a really good not a robot test, like checking if you, you know, have a spleen or not, it's not really gonna be all that effective. So what do we do? People have lots of passwords. I myself, I've got at least five email accounts, a couple financial accounts, and probably a bajillion forum and IRC accounts, all that sort of stuff. So how do you keep track? This is a terrible option. Don't ever do this. If you're doing this, stop. <laughs> and if I need to explain why, it's because one account gets compromised, that means they know the password for all your accounts now. That's really bad. Write them down on paper. This is probably a little bit better than this, but still pretty awful. There's no security with a piece of paper at all. An unencrypted file is probably about the same as a piece of paper. I know a lot of people that put it into a text file or an Excel spreadsheet, whatever you want to call it. Browser autofill is, out of all these, probably the best option to pick, simply because it's a little bit more difficult to get at, and you do get the convenience factor. But I still probably wouldn't recommend that long term. How bad is it? This awesome quote here, um, basically saying 91% of people they understand the risk of using the same password across multiple accounts, but almost 60% say they do it anyway, <laughs> which is not a good number to see. And again, 60% of those people said they're afraid of forgetting their passwords, which again, that's a really bad thing, but thankfully a password manager can solve this. And 50% say they also wanna be in control of their passwords as well, which again, a password manager can help with. But here it gets worse. 53% of them confessed to not changing them in the past year. That's really bad. And also, that's after they were told there was a data breach involving a password compromise. And here's the real kicker. 15% of them would say they would rather do a chore, or 11% or would say sit in traffic than change their passwords. So this is a big problem, don't you think? <laughs> yes, sir. It would be intriguing to ask the people in this room who are sensitive to security issues because they're mm. here. How many of us sin these sins? Yeah, exactly. I'm not gonna pull anybody in fear of, you know, <laughs> shaming people. You know, you're here to learn, so hopefully when you go home, you take this knowledge with you. Um, this study was pulled from a group of users that had recently signed up for LastPass. So that's kind of where that data comes from. I've got a link in the slide at the very end, so. We also suck at making passwords. This is pulled from like the top six or top five passwords pulled from Troy Hunt's pwned password set. So these are like the most common passwords that people use. Yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. 
that now you know why we put in those minimum password limits is because realistically we need to prevent people from doing this. And obviously there's also the talk about entropy and that sort of thing. You can insert the XKCD slide right here, horse battery staple, whatever you want to call it. And that does have its benefits, um, but it does have some downsides too. So what's the real solution? It's a password manager. Solves a lot of problems. Remembers the passwords for you, hopefully. If it doesn't, then it's not a very good password manager. Uh, it's encrypted at rest, so hopefully the file on your file system is encrypted, so you need either a private key or a password to get into that, and hopefully that password you're using for encryption is strong. It has expiration reminders, so it'll remind you, hey, this password for your Facebook or Twitter account, you need to go change that. It's been the same thing for like six months. And it also automatically will set up strong password generation. So it'll actually make strong passwords for you automatically, which is really beneficial. Saves a lot of work. But wait, there's more. You've also got automatic login and auto typing. Depending on the password manager and its feature set, you can usually have it uh, hit a hotkey and then basically go into your web browser, paste in your stuff or whatever else you want to log into. It's also hopefully secure software with minimal, <coughs> minimal vulnerabilities because obviously it'd be a bad password manager if that were the case. And also hopefully it's got organization sorting options if you're like me and you have over 3 billion accounts. So some examples of some good password managers. So there's kind of three types, technically speaking. You've got the local database file ones, which is your key pass and one <coughs> password, those guys. Those guys just keep a local file right on your file system. It's not synchronized anywhere, it just lives on that device. Centralized server, that has two sort of sub-options. You can either self-host, so that's stuff like Bitwarden, Device42, or even a Nextcloud plugin. Those are pretty good. Or you can also do the in the cloud, cloud, um, where you can do LastPass or Dashlane. And if, if I ever get a recommendation for someone that is non-technical, like has no idea about computers and is just concerned about their password security, hopefully, um, LastPass is usually what I would just point them to, just because it's dead simple for them. But I personally don't agree with how their business model and whatnot is set up. Each type does have a downside. With the local database files, uh, doesn't follow you between devices, which is kind of a problem. Yes, sir? I, I moved my PPAS file to Dropbox or Amazon mm -hmm. Web Services, so I still have it everywhere. That is a very good point. That does fall into the centralized <coughs> server or cloud side of things, though. <coughs> Um, which I'll point out in just a minute. So local database file doesn't follow you between <coughs> devices, but we'll fix that in a bit. Centralized server, you've only got a central attack location. If an attacker knows that you've got your database file on a server somewhere, either a cloud server or something you rolled your own, then yeah, they have a kind of an attack target they can focus on. Um, and if you do a self-rolled one, you gotta set up and secure it or use a cloud option and hope that they've done the setup and secure portion of things properly. So what's a sync thing? Sync thing is basically just a file sync program, honestly. Works on all major platforms, uh, like a stupid amount of platforms. Like they have a Symbian OS port for some reason. I don't know why. Um, they've also got free as in speech and in beer, so that's always important. And it's a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection between devices that you choose to allow, which I think is probably the key thing here. That means that there's no centralized server to necessarily attack. It's all just directly between your devices. So there's no sort of centralized infrastructure really required in this scenario. Um, it's also encrypted in transit. It uses TLS encryption over the wire. So you basically have got double encryption as long as your password file is already encrypted. <coughs> then you've got encryption while it's in transit. And the cool thing is it syncs only the changes you make. So it's a nice delta sync. So saves you time for syncing a large file when you make just one little change. And that even comes as a bit of a security feature. If someone does happen to grab your traffic and somehow decrypt it, and then somehow decrypt the file within that encrypted traffic, they're only gonna get what you just changed. They're not gonna get all your accounts, just a little bit of what you just changed. Which compromising one account's a lot better than compromising all your accounts. So how does it work? In scenario one, we've got two PCs. One is at one location and another's at another location. They are both connected to the internet. They both contact a global discovery server and tell it their IP address and sync ID. 
PCA adds the sync ID to PCB's, uh, or PCA's config gets PCB's sync ID. You add that in manually. PCB is notified that PCA wants to connect, <coughs> and the user can choose to accept or reject that. It'll show with the user sync ID as well as the name of the PC that it's providing, usually based on the host name. Um, and then PCB will say, yeah, I accept that, or no, I don't, don't talk to me again. And then PCA will then say, okay, well, you accepted me. I have these folders I want to share with you. And then the user on PCB can optionally approve or disapprove folders and allow them to send those files or receive those files in any which way it chooses. Scenario two is a little more simple. This is kind of more of a local LAN setup, which is what I'll hopefully be demonstrating after the slides here. So we got two PCs that are on the same local network with the same subnet, PCA and PCB. PC A and B broadcast using an IPv6 broadcast traffic to all the hosts on the network to try and find other peers. PCA finds PCB and remembers the sync ID. So when you go in to add it, it'll actually auto-populate it with a list of possible options based on what you've typed in so far. And as you'll probably see in a little bit, it's a really handy feature because the sync IDs are pretty long. Um, when the user goes to add PCB, it's automatically available to pick. And then the sync just happens directly over the network. Sync thing's smart enough to recognize if there's two hosts that are on the same subnet, it'll say, hey, rather than sending this traffic out to the internet and then back, we can just directly connect over the LAN. It's smart enough to detect that. So it's pretty amazing. So what's the catch? Marcus, you're selling me this amazing product. You haven't told me what's the downsides yet. Well, it does take a bit of setup. Not a ton. Not as much as, like, say, centralized infrastructure or anything along those lines, like a NextCloud or Device Story 2, those sorts of solutions I talked about earlier. Um, you have to set up sync thing, and then you also have to change your passwords, obviously, because you probably have insecure passwords already, and you'll want to uh, change those to be secure and add them into your database and put them into the password manager, which also is going to be quite a task if you have a lot of accounts like I do. I probably spent a good like day and a half just doing this to move all my accounts over. Um, adding new devices is easier though, because all you got to do is just install sync thing and add them to your other devices. Um, and there's also an introducer feature, which is pretty cool. Um, if you have a lot of devices like me, I've got, you know, I've got a MacBook, I've got my ThinkPad, I've got a gaming laptop, I've got my phone, my tablet, my desktop, all those devices can automatically be re-added using this introducer feature, where basically if a new host is connecting up to an existing infrastructure of SyncThing hosts, you can check that introducer box and that'll basically say, hey, this new PC, let's introduce it to the rest of the systems, automatically start adding the folders and adding the hosts. So it's a little more one touch in that sense, um, which is pretty handy. But yeah, that's it. SyncThing can also just sync files in general. So here's some great use cases that I've used SyncThing for, and there's probably way more than this. You can just do pictures and videos from your phone to your NAS, your PC, to free up storage on your phone. Um, I use it to synchronize my document files between my PC and my laptop, because I like to work on the go, and then when I get home, I like to get on my desktop, big monitors, nice keyboard, all that stuff. File backups to your NAS, I use this one a ton, because this is awesome. It's basically like a continuous sync over to your NAS. So any sort of changes you make in a folder or if you want to back up your whole system, your home drive, anything like that, all backed up automatically. And uh, I've even used it to send large files to friends over the internet. Um, so that's also really handy too. And the nice thing is you don't really need to worry too much about doing firewall reconfiguration because of that relay server. Yes, sir? Send files to your friends that encrypted files? Yeah, they are encrypted in transit. So anything that you send over the wire is going to be encrypted with TLS encryption. So. It works off the premises of certificates. So. so hopefully, if I have this working properly, it is time for a live demo. So hopefully you guys can see this here. I've got a Windows 7 VM and a Debian VM here. I'm going to log into the Debian VM here for you guys. And yeah, we'll refresh that. It's probably because that VM went to sleep. There we go. So you can see in here, hopefully the text is, is the text large enough for you guys in the back? OK, cool. So basically what you can see in here is we've got two sort of sections, so to speak. This is where your folders are going to live, and it's basically going to tell you the status of each of your folders. And then this is your device here. It gives you a whole bunch of statistics, version, how long SyncThing Daemon's been running, how many discovery server you're connected to, that sort of thing. 
And then remote devices, we don't have any in here yet, but we'll fix that in a moment. Um, that basically just shows us what other devices can we talk to that we've added. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I've got a key pass database here on this Debian VM. And I want to go ahead and add this to my Windows 7 VM. So if I click on this and probably start typing a bit here, or I probably need to get the sync ID. So I basically go to actions show ID on the client that I want to actually connect to. And it spits out this sync ID here at the top. It's probably pretty small, but you can see it's pretty long. <laughs> And then if you're adding it to a phone or a tablet or something with a camera, you can also scan the QR code, which is pretty nice. I like that feature a lot. So basically, we can sort of just copy this guy here and then go down to the Debian VM. And then we can, uh, well, there we go. Our discovery just happened. So you can see that it probably picked up on, that's probably my local laptop here. And then that's going to be the Windows 7 VM. I usually just look at the last five characters of the sync ID, and that usually makes that happen. And then device name, if we want to give it a custom name from the Debian VM's perspective, we totally can. This is literally just a label. So if you want to name it whatever, you can. I'm going to leave it blank so it auto-populates and just pulls from the client. And then in here, a lot of these settings you usually won't need to futz with. Um, the only thing that you can do really is set the compression. So you can have it compress all data before it gets sent over the wire, which is good if you have like a slow internet connection or like a bandwidth cap. Um, you can just compress the metadata, or you can turn that off doesn't really matter. If you do all data, it does increase the CPU consumption on both hosts because it has to compress and then decompress as it receives. Introducers, the feature I talked about earlier. So basically, when we check this device or check this box, when we add the Windows 7 host to this sync thing cloud, it's going to introduce us or introduce the Windows 7 VM to the rest of the other devices we have in sync thing. Right now, I've just got the Debian VM and the Windows 7 VM, so this doesn't really matter. And I've already got a default folder. SyncThing makes a default folder under your home directory called Sync that you can use out of the box. Um, but we're going to not sync that because I have an existing folder that I already want to add. So I'm going to go ahead and click Save. And then this is going to just be sort of not populated yet until the discovery process happens. While that's going on, I'm going to go ahead and add my folder. So in here, you've got the folder label, which is just a label, basically. The folder ID is something a little bit interesting. Basically, what that does is it's kind of like a passphrase you almost share with one another. You can say, my folder passphrase is going to be this string. It used to be in sync thing that you had to manually set that, but now they auto-generate it. Um, I'm old school, and I like to sync it manually. So I'm going to do it key pass. And I'll also give it a label of key pass as well. And then this is just going to be the path on the local file system. So I'm going to do key pass. And I'm going to say, I want to share this folder with the Windows 7 VM. And then I can also expand out the advanced settings and get really granular with sync properties. You can set the interval of rescanning the file system. So this will increase disk usage a little bit. But um, if you need to constantly make sure you're up to date on synchronizing between your hosts, that's a useful feature. Uh, minimum free disk space, so that way you don't accidentally fill up the disk. You end up copying, you know, a bunch of garbage into a sync directory by accident. This will prevent the disk from completely filling up and usually locking up your box or something horrible along those lines. <laughs> um, the folder type, so this is kind of neat. This is basically if you want to have more of a tra traditional sort of client server architecture, you can set it up so that way this is a send only folder. So any changes that you make on the client side, it won't receive. Um, in our particular use case, we're going to do send and receive because we want to have the same data across all of our devices. Um, but that's just an option for you. You can do a file pull order if you really want to. I don't bother. <laughs> um, and then file versioning is pretty cool. So if you do have conflict issues, SyncThing can kind of automatically manage these sorts of things and make it so it's a bit easier to resolve. So there's a more traditional trash can filing, uh, file versioning style, where basically it moves it to a hidden ST versions folder. I know that text is probably a bit small, but all this stuff I'm talking about is on the documentation for sync thing. So, um, and then you can also have it automatically empty out that folder too, if you want. Then the other option is just to do a simple file versioning. So basically it just keeps a certain number of old files, adds a date stamp to the file name, pretty straightforward. You can also do staggered file versioning. So this basically kind of combines the two, um, where it does both the trash can automatic purging stuff and also keeping multiple copies. 
um, and then also kind of make sure that those copies are also tracked in a meaningful way. And you can even do external file versioning. Um, this is if you want to get really advanced and like integrate this with like a versioning system. Uh, I don't use this. Maybe somebody else does. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and set this just to simple file versioning. And I'm just going to go ahead and keep two versions. I'll be fine with that. Cool. So I'll go ahead and save. And it says this folder is up to date because there's no hosts yet that we've accepted to sync with us. So you can see it says disconnected. It's already picked up on a few IP addresses. Here's the IPv6 local discovery right here. Um, and then also it's connected to a couple relays, of course. The GUI does like to refresh a lot, so sometimes you may have to pause it. And then also a local IPv4 address to do the actual data connection. So I'm gonna switch over my Windows 7 VM. And we get a prompt here saying, hey, this new device wants to talk to you, gives us name, sync ID, and the IP address and port number. We'll just go ahead and click Add Device. And then we can also pick from other nearby devices. It calls nearby devices basically um, anything that's on the local network, as I was describing earlier. Um, since it's already sent over its host name, we'll automatically have that populated, but we can change it. Sharing, again, we can enable Introducer. We can choose to share the default folder on this device with the Debian VM, but uh, we're not using that in this circumstance. And then, uh, again, here's your compression options just like before. So we'll go ahead and hit Save. And then if we give it about 30 seconds or so, yep, there we go. That was way faster than when I tested it last night. So now we're getting a prompt to say, hey, I got the KeyPass folder for you. Do you want it? And we'll say, yeah, we want that. <laughs> And we can pick the path to put it in. And we want to share with the LFNW demo device that we have. File versioning, again, we can set up the file versioning as we want. And the reason why this GUI is slightly different is because this is a bit of a different version of Sync thing. This is Sync Trezor for Windows. And basically what it does is it just provides a nice sort of GUI interface for Windows to use with Sync thing. Um, but f uh, fundamentally, it's still the underlying same program. It's just a different way it's presented that makes it a little bit easier to work with. Um, on Debian over here, I've just got it in a browser. Um, you just go to your local host on port 8384 by default. And you can secure this, by the way. By default, you can only connect on localhost, um, but you can enable it to connect from anywhere and then also add a HTTPS certificate. So it's a bit more encrypted. And also give it like a password and stuff too. So that's pretty cool. Um, we'll go back to here and ignore patterns. This is basically if you want to exclude certain files. This is helpful, especially on Windows, if you have like an images folder or something. For instance, you from syncing over like the desktop INI, thumbs DB files, that sort of thing. Um, and then again, kind of similar stuff as we saw before, minimum free disk space, send and receive, all that cool stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save. <coughs> and we can see in here, <coughs> that it says it's up to date, but it's probably going to pick up on the fact that we have a file. And there we go. It just synchronized that file, just like that. Granted, it is only a two kilobyte file, but usually syncing with, say, I've got a directory of about 500 megs of document files. That usually syncs in about a minute over the local network. It's pretty quick. Um, and then if we go back to here, we can see we've got a new remote device. We've got my Windows 7 VM. It says what folders we're sharing with it, the version, IP address, and any sort of download or upload data that we're sending and receiving at the same time. So that's really it when it comes to sync thing, honestly. It's that easy to set up. As long as you got the two devices right in front of you, it's pretty straightforward. And as long as they're on the same LAN, you can do the auto discovery thing. If not, you can just um, you know send yourself the ID, that sort of thing, if you want to get uh, little more creative with it so uh, but yeah that's all I really had I mean let's see here oh, of course it's gonna want to skip to that <laughs> there we go so here's some just some sources uh, just the Troy hunt password database and that's the article I got from uh, the log me study and then also the excellent excellent sync thing documentation if you want to set up sync thing and really get creative with it that is a phenomenal resource um, so that's all I really had for the presentation. I know I kind of went at a breakneck speed, but I did want to make sure we got through everything. I've got my website and my blog. Slides are already posted on there. And if you have questions, there's my email address. So I think we can go ahead and open up for Q&A or if you guys want to see something else. 
Same thing wise? I want to show a simple old technology solution. You can keep <laughs> your passwords in plain text, and it's unlikely anybody's going to get a hold of them. <laughs> <laughs> that does work. The only question is I don't think most computers these days have a uh, floppy drive that size. <laughs> Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about the password database you use? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can go ahead and show that real quick. Um, let me go ahead and open up KeyPass on here. Please <coughs> KeyPass X, not the KeyPass. Yeah. yeah, so there's basically there's a lot of versions of KeyPass. <laughs> um, KeyPass in itself is not so much a program. It is more of just a file format, to be honest with you. Um, so that, there's the password manager I use. I've just got some examples in here because I'm not going to show you guys my real logins. Aww. Sorry. Aww. Sorry. You know, I, I like having money. I don't know about you guys. I like having groceries. I like having a car, a house. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually, I'll go ahead and pull this up here. So, you can kind of see it's very small text, I know, but I'll go ahead and blow it up. Uh, yeah, so we've got key pass versions for Android, iOS, Mac OS, blah, 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 Windows, whatever. Windows Phone for like the three people that still use that. <laughs> Windows Tablet for the one person that still uses that. <laughs> Pocket PC for absolutely nobody. Oh God, why are you still doing that? <laughs> one for Chromebooks, so if you're stuck on Chrome. One for Blackberry in case you're super old school. And if you're really old school, you got one for J2ME phones. So, yeah, there's that. Um, you've also got one for Palm OS. <laughs> Again, why would you need that? But, I mean, cool. So, and there's even a Java library, too. So, if you have a device that runs Java, you can implement that as a library. So, KeePass is widely available on a billion platforms, which is just hilarious to me. Who uses Palm OS still? Um, and then here's the sync thing website. So again, text is a bit small, so I'll blow that up for you guys. But you can see right here, they've got natively compiled versions for every CPU architecture in the sun for Linux. They got Windows, they've got FreeBSD, Solaris, all the other BSDs, Mac OS, and also the source code. So you can compile it for your own platform. Um, so yeah, and then also it's got some GUI integrations all the way over here. So sync tracer, as I mentioned earlier, if you do want a GUI version that's a little nicer to look at rather than just a web browser tab, there is SyncThing GTK for Linux if you're comfortable with using GTK. Um, and then also a Mac OS bundle too, um, which actually works pretty well. I've been using that lately on my MacBook and it's been pretty nice. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I really had in terms of just kind of showing you briefly all the uh, platforms that's supported on that. So yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, Mark, there's a question for you. So we Mm -hmm. Sync, one, one of the other person was asking about using Dropbox or yeah. something else with Sync. Um, and also, for, so, but for synchronization, Sync thing is pretty cross platform. Very. But I think you just asked Sync kind of good. But if you look at the forums that they queue, the author said they, they haven't ported it, for example, to iOS. That mm. to. Mm -hmm. What's your solution there if we have users? You know, that's a great question. I don't use iOS, so I haven't encountered that problem yet. Um, but yeah, I know, I know there's an iOS port in the works. I think it's mainly just due to the iOS sort of developer limitations they place on third-party apps that's kind of halting that. Um, but hopefully that should be done soon. So they've been working on it for quite a while. Yeah, it looks like some forms like four or five years. So. Yeah, they've been working on it for a long while. I'll put it this way. SyncThing just got its V1 release probably, I don't know, few-ish months ago, like maybe six, nine months ago. Um, and I've been using it for a good three years or so. I used it back when it was 0 0.9, and it was very alpha, very alpha. Um, but it worked. When it was awesome, it was awesome when it worked. I'll put it that way. So well, thank you for your question. Anybody else? No quick. Oh, yep. I use this this exact same system. I want to mention the, the versioning is really helpful. Yeah. I had a database that was corrupted, <coughs> The versioning is pretty much what saves your goat and prevents you from getting corrupted. Yes, sir. Just for those who like to use things like Drop Pass, like Dropbox, which I use, mm -hmm. I'm switching over to Amazon because Dropbox just implemented you can only have three linked devices. 
Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, it caught me off guard because off guard, I got more than three. So you can't use it unless you pay $10 a month. Yeah. But you get a terabyte on Amazon for a dollar something a month. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that is the one kind of thing you have to keep in mind with sync thing is if you are planning on using to synchronize a whole bunch of files and kind of share them, you do need to have the disk space for it. it there's no sort of cloud anything in this whatsoever. It's all just peer-to-peer -peer directly on your devices, which is cool in a way because it's fully decentralized, so you don't have to worry about some sort of service shutting down, but which is nice. But it's not a backup solution because if you delete it on one device, it's mm -hmm. going to... Yeah. You've got to shut down yep. things quick before it starts rippling out and it deletes Absolutely, it. absolutely. Yeah, and that's why doing the file versioning is helpful. Yes, sir? Uh, so the FTC put out a, uh, an article saying that they actually recommend you not changing your passwords periodically. Mm. So is it still, because for a bunch of different reasons, um, but so I was like, is it, do you still want to change your password periodically if you have some, you know, 20 character completely random, like, you know, a, a you know, generated password? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, I haven't read that article yet, but I'm definitely going to check it out now that you brought it up. Um, my rationale, and I think most people's rationale is, is that you're kind of using the analogy of a needle in a haystack, but if you keep changing the needle inside the haystack that you're trying to find, it's going to make it a lot less likely for people to get in. Um, but I'll definitely, I'll definitely check that out. Yes, sir. Another issue, of course, that, that is, you know, similar to you, I've got over 200 passwords. Exactly. And just the time spent to try to go in on sites and change them yeah you know, it could take days and oh yeah for sure absolutely i totally agree and that's one benefit that keypass does have is it can at least remind you to go change at least that account for you know you think about do i need to change this one did i change that one that sort of thing so it kind of helps with automatically in a way managing those but there's no sort of integration because every website's different obviously um, unless they've got some sort of api that you can use then maybe you can make something together but I usually have my passwords on like roughly a three to six month rotation. I do once a month if it's something really important like finance stuff, but usually for like forums, social media stuff, I usually do three to six months. So good question, by the way. Anybody else? Anybody else? How do you feel about like KeyPass uh, plugin for browsers? Um, I've tried using them and they were pretty good. Um, the one thing I ran into was sometimes it doesn't paste in the right fields. So sometimes your password will get pasted into the username field. Um, what I would eventually like to see is when you do the auto type option, it gives you sort of just a crosshair and you can click on the first field you want to start dumping your credentials into. Um, the nice thing about key, uh, key pass, I'll pull it up here actually, is that if I go into like this here, you can change the auto type sequence on this. So you can basically say, um, I want to do a custom key shortcut, look for a window with a specific title, that sort of thing. And granted, this is specific to key pass, not so much sync thing. So realistically, you can use a different password manager that has a local database file if it has the feature set that's good for you. So very flexible. Yes, sir. Yes, one more thing about key pass. It's more than just a password manager. Mm -hmm. You have all kinds of other information from driver's license, birth certificate, yep. all kinds of stuff that you need to remember and only know you don't want to write down on paper. Yep. And you can put that all into KeyPass. It doesn't have to be a password. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got a very good point. It's a place to get to encrypted data. Uh, yeah, you have a very good point, actually. Yeah, like a uh, great thing to put in here would be like account routing numbers for your bank, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, how often, yeah, you know, what's your, your credit card when it expires? Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. What do you suggest for an off-site copy for disaster recovery? Um, so there's a couple ways you can do that. You could set up like another host with sync thing. That's perfectly valid. Um, personally, what I do for offsite right now is since I have fast enough internet, I just sync over to a server in North Carolina and I consider that good enough for me personally. Um, but really it's going to be specifically whatever you need and whatever meets your needs best. So some people prefer just having a hard drive that they take offsite and store somewhere like a friend's house. Some people prefer having just a cloud backup somewhere. So it's really just going to depend on what your needs are specifically and just consider all the options. So does, so does KeyPass not autofill a password username field when you go to a website? You have to like manually go into KeyPass? Yeah, so I can actually show that here. If I do a right click, you can do a perform auto type right there. And I'll pull up a text editor so that way you guys can kind of see that here. Um, but yeah, if I just do a right click on this guy and then do perform auto type, it just dumps my email and also an example password 
in there. Um, and it also hits tab, that's why there's the uh, tab there. It hits tab so that we can go down to the password field and then hits enter at the very end of that. And usually most login forms accept that sort of stuff. If not, you can go back in to KeyPass back here. And like I said earlier, you can go in and modify the auto type stuff. So you can use a custom auto type sequence where you can do like tab and shift and that sort of stuff. So it's almost kind of like using auto hotkey or something like that. Um, so you can customize it if the website has like a funky form fill out or doesn't like using the enter key for logging in, that sort of thing. So, good question, by the way. Anybody else? Okay, just a, another suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, key pass, for example, or pass lane or any of those. Use a long password, not necessarily random characters, mm -hmm. but a, a typed sentence. Yeah. For example, the longer the better. Something you're going to remember, but it's going to be harder to guess. Yeah, absolutely. You can actually see in here, this is kind of the um, automatic generation feature. And it has a lot of really intelligent options in here. You can see the length. You can see what character types you want to put in. So if you need to satisfy a um, specific requirement needing to have a symbol or something in there, you can fill that in. Um, and then you can also use the slider or the number over here, and you can get really stupid with the password length. I've had, password, I've had websites rejecting a lot of these auto-generated. You've got to say it doesn't like symbols or it doesn't like yeah, the length. So you, exactly. Sometimes you've got to dumb it down, actually. To yeah, and so that's a nice thing, too, is you can actually reveal the password, and then you can modify it manually, too. So you can have it generate a secure base, but then add in something that the password needs to have, for instance. Or, or delete, yeah. Fake, or delete, okay, or whatever. So take, you can just take those out. Yep, exactly. Types. Yep, exactly. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. You can even, like, do that, and then I've got this abomination of a password. Good luck remembering that. Um, so, yeah, it's this is a really nice feature set for an application that's probably only, like, two, three, four megabytes of disk space, probably uses like a meg of RAM. So it's very, very optimized. Do you use the version one or the version two of the data? I use version two. Um, I tend to find that it just works a little bit better compared to version one. Version one kind of seems more of like a legacy holdover for people that are still using version one stuff. But I had a problem so. with Android. So a lot of the Android apps, I don't know if it's changed now, but mm. they won't accept the version two database. Yeah, so actually if I go back to here, there are some, like, they're highlighted with this little 2x icon that only will say uh, you can only use 2x databases. The one in particular I use is just KeyPass Droid, this one right here. It doesn't say that it's not compatible with 1x devices or uh, databases, but um, I haven't had to need to use a 1x database yet. So, um, But you can also convert your database, too, if I recall correctly. Yeah. So. That's only one direction. Yeah, it's only one direction. Once you go from 1x to 2x, you can't go back. So but I've got KeyPass 2 Android. Yeah, I've okay. got that on my phone. And the other one is, uh, I think, KeyPass, uh, KeyPass Droid. Okay. I use yeah, KeyPass Droid. Yeah. yeah. And that one works perfectly fine with my 2x database. Might which, work with the 1x. One, sorry? KeyPass Droid. Yeah, KeyPass Droid. That's the one I use. Yeah. Nice thing, too, is that it integrates with... Um, sort of other auth authentication methods. So like on my phone, I have to put in a password and do a fingerprint scan to yeah. get in my password database. It's not very intuitive how you set up that fingerprint scan, I found. Yeah, it's dependent on the phone specifically. Um, I mean, personally, I've got an S9. So for me, it was just an option to like fill it in based on Samsung's like autofill thing, so. Do you ever use the key files? Um, I don't personally because the issue with a key file, if you put that, say, into your sync thing thing, that's like, leaving the key to your house on your doormat. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, you have the security, but the key's right there. Um, so you would have to probably synchronize or bring the key with you in a totally different way, probably on like an offline storage device would be like the best thing I could think of. Um, so I just stick to a complex but single password that I can remember to get into my password database. Yes, sir. And it's even simpler if you have one of those more sophisticated thumbprint readers. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a good point, too. To get into your key pass on the desktop, for example, you don't have to type in that long thing. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. You talked quite a bit about key pass. Um, nothing about uh, one password other than that one slide. What are your thoughts on that? And yeah, um, it's more just an alternative, really. There's some people, I guess, that you know don't care for key pass, and one password's a very similar application, behaves in a very similar way, and has similar features. Um, so I just tried to provide more than one example. Okay. So. But a uh, good question. 
And by the way, that uh, one password does sync across your at least iOS devices. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's very good. Okay, cool. Well, if you want iOS device syncing for one password, then there you go. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Cool. Well, uh, if you guys want to stick around and ask me questions, or you can leave and go check out the rest of the convention for Sunday. Thank you very much for coming out. Really appreciate it. And uh, like I said, my slides are up online on my website and my blog. And then I've also got my email address. So if you have comments or questions or just want to chat, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm pretty responsive. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. It's a hospitalist who uh, addresses only like Darth Vader. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Sometimes I'm really interested in because I've got an S9 as well. Oh, okay. But I don't use the fingerprint uh, scanner for it. I gotcha. I'm one of those tinfoil hat people. <laughs> so is there a way to do it without going through and signing up with um, yeah. Samsung? Yeah, so what I just have here is it gives me the fingerprint option, but I can also just put in a password or use a key file, just like I was on the desktop. But you said you could do both? You could do a password and a... Yeah, so I basically can just put in my password. Da, 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 da. And then what I do is I hit the fingerprint after putting my password in. Oh, hang on. Helps if I type my password correctly. It's tough when you have big fingers. I mean, you're on camera here, you better. <laughs> so yeah, I've got my password put in, I just do my fingerprint, and then boom, it gets me in, so. And okay, so that's just, you don't have to set anything else up on the phone then. Yeah, so as long as you have the fingerprint already enabled on a lot of password fields, it'll give you a little fingerprint icon that you can click on, and then add your fingerprint as a login method. Yeah, I've okay. So. I mostly just use the fingerprint because it's way easier for me than putting in my password because my password's a little bit long and I have big thumbs. <laughs> no, I got you. Well, and then, yeah, if you don't use a fingerprint to get into your phone, then yeah, that kind of solves that issue too. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right, gotcha. Is there any concern about the clipboard storing your passwords when you... That's a very good point. Um, so on most KeyPass installations, by default, it'll clear out the clipboard after about 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. So that's usually enough time for you to go to whatever application you need, paste in the password, and then by the time you're logged in, it's already wiped the clipboard for you. So most KeyPass applications will do that. Um, and you can also configure that too. You can make it have a shorter or longer interval. So. Okay. Is there, uh, for the, I know I've had issues with certain websites with the tabbing versus mm -hmm. Android. Yep. Is there a, thing within KeyPass to show you how to do that or you type in the action? Um, so the documentation for KeyPass actually goes into that a little bit. Um, let me see if I can find it. But yeah, there's basically a um, document that shows you like the syntax for that. I need to try and find it on the website. I haven't looked it up in a very long time because usually for most websites, the default works pretty darn well. Yeah, so um, go to a new page after you enter the yeah, exactly. Or um, I think you can even configure like a delay and stuff too if you really wanted to. So it's very flexible. It's almost very similar to auto hotkey if you've ever used that. So um, pretty extensible. So. Is it the main, it's kind of the main security concern with password managers? Is it that password you get in all the passwords? So yeah. And so that's why initially you pick a very secure password or use a key file to get into your database. Okay. And then the rest of the passwords you have for all your online accounts, those are all going to be random garbled mishmash. So it's going to be pretty difficult to get into those, just as long as you make sure it's a password that's long enough and has good requirements yeah. for complexity. What, what were your thoughts on like, like the philosophy of changing your passwords every month versus not? What do you think the advantage of not? Um, well, it does save you the effort. That is a benefit, um, obviously. Um, yeah, and there's there's some. Um, realistically, I think it's mostly people are either afraid that they're going to lose access to their account or they don't want to put in the effort, I think is the main reason why people don't do it. Um, I'm still fairly firm in the camp of you should change your password on a regular occasion just because that needle in the haystack analogy I was mentioning earlier. Um, but that's just my personal belief. You know, I don't have your accounts. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Just because somebody gets your password doesn't mean they're gonna use it right away. So they might hold right. on to it for a while.
Well, the, the other thing you mentioned earlier, Marcus, was multi-factor authentication, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. If you'll run a, you know, authenticator app as a second factor, yeah. Then even if they get your passwords, it's much harder to get in. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Because then they have to physically have your token as well. Unless you're using SMS, and they compromise SMS. So it's, yeah, it's Just good. Spoofing your SIM. Uh, yeah, there's a whole conf you can go look up SMS MFA spoofing. Uh, so it's much better to use an authenticator app. So yeah. Google Authenticator is okay. There's much better ones though. Yeah. We're actually organizing. So we've got like 50 MFA tokens. For but it's kind of a matter of whatever that particular account will use, right? Most good accounts will let you use MFA now. Yeah. yeah. Most of the okay, stuff that's actually good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, most, most places will do MFA. Um, all the banks that I use and financial stuff I use uses MFA. Insurance company does MFA. Um, so there's definitely more adoption in places where it's really important, but I want to see it more adopted in places where people traditionally wouldn't think of having it. Um, just because MFA is probably one of the best ways to prevent doing brute forcing or having your password just compromised in a breach. Because um, as long as they don't have your token and they can't spoof an SMS message if it's through an app or a website or something, then you're going to be pretty darn safe. Can you set up KeyPass with a YubiKey? Um, that's a great question. I don't have a YubiKey, so I haven't played around with that. I probably would imagine there's probably some sort of integration for it. Um, KeyPass has been actively developed for a very long time, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's probably some sort of integration with it. Um, well, I think probably my setup I've got is pretty darn safe. I can't really think of anything beyond someone physically getting a hold of my device and then figuring out my key pass password. Um, I would say probably the only thing that I'm vulnerable against right now is if someone were able to get my password database and then attempt to brute force it. Um, I don't know if there's a feature for it or not, but I know in some other password managers, there's like a self-destruct option. So you can do that, but obviously then you'll lose access to all your stuff. Um, and the nice thing too is that if you do ever forget your password or your password manager screws up, something like that, there's usually going to be a forgot password option. So as long as you got access to that email that you made the account with or whatever the case may be for their password recovery options, you usually can get back in. So it's not the end of the world if you lose your database or your database gets corrupt. So. Well, it is two minutes past, so I'm going to have to clear out here. But uh, thank you very much.